juice in Java. Updates from the Pittsburgh shooting last week that left 11 people dead. And we have two remembered scholars here in studio to tell us how they are remembering the lives lost in the Pan Am crash from 30 years ago. And I'm going to take you guys into the fourth annual dance marathon, Autothon, here on campus. Juice in Java starts right now. Good morning and thanks for starting your morning with us. I'm Zach Allen. And I'm Morgan Trow. Let's kick things off with the morning brew. All the headlines you need to know from the past week. And I don't think that anyone's settled. I don't think we're, we're happy where we're at and I really mean that. I think that there's guys still working to get the job done because there's still a lot of work to be done. The Orange are going bowling for the first time in five years. SU football's win against NC State last week marks the sixth win they needed for bowl eligibility. Plus, the Orange are ranked for the first time in 17 years, holding the number 22 spot in the AP poll. What happened was not just criminal. It was evil, and we will never allow violence or anti-Semitism to take hold in the United States of America. That was Vice President Mike Pence responding to the shooting in a Pittsburgh synagogue that left 11 people dead. The suspect in the attack, Robert Bowers, is being indicted on 44 counts. Most make him eligible for the death penalty. And 189 people are dead after a Lion Air flight crashed into the sea off of the coast of Indonesia. Investigators have since found the flight's black box and hope it will enable them to find the cause of the crash. Google employees across the world walked out of offices on Thursday to protest the tech giant's handling of executives who commit sexual misconduct. Protests spanned the globe in locations such as London, Tokyo, Switzerland, Berlin, and closer to the home in New York City. Back here on campus, SU remembers the lives lost 30 years ago in the Pan Am flight that exploded and killed all members on board, including 35 SU students. Events concluded with the annual Rose Lang ceremony yesterday at the Remembrance Wall. This has been your Morning Brew. And now let's delve deeper into this week's top stories with The Squeeze. Earlier this week, an Indonesian passenger plane crashed off the coast of Jakarta. Only 15 minutes into its journey, the flight disappeared from the radar. Hours later, debris from the Lion Air flight was found in the Java Sea. Divers immediately searched through the sea and recovered a few bodies. Investigators have not found any survivors yet. Aviation experts believe that the crash was due to equipment failure, but more will be determined after they uncover information on the flight's black box. This device holds the last known speed, altitude, wind speed, and other operations. So they just recently found the main fuselage of the plane, and they got a ping back in the water from the black box. So once they get that, that's going to open this whole thing wide open. But you told me this morning that this situation just got even worse when they sent the rescue crews out? Yeah, actually, um, a rescuer who is a scuba diver was underwater and was reported missing by his partner. And then they found him unconscious, and a couple hours later, he died. You know, Zach, I know that you're a really big scuba diver. How easy is it for something to go wrong? So many things can go wrong when you're underwater, and especially when you have a rescue mission like that, you're not necessarily paying as much attention to yourself as you are to your surroundings, and things can go wrong in a split second. And another deadly incident back here in the States. 11 people are dead after a gunman opened fire in a synagogue in Pittsburgh last week. Among the victims are a 97-year-old Holocaust survivor and a couple that got married over 60 years ago in the same building. The suspect, 46-year-old Robert Bowers, faces 44 charges. The charges include murder, hate crime, obstructing religious practices, and more. Prosecutors are hoping to enforce the death penalty, and authorities are calling the shooting the worst anti-Semitic incident in U.S. history. Now, Morgan, I know... This one unfortunately struck home a little bit more with you. Yeah, um, as a Jewish citizen of the United States, uh, I knew a lot of people who actually belong to the Tree of Life Synagogue. And I know a lot of people who actually have a lot of family members who were there during the event. And it is just so disheartening to see this happen on American soil, especially with the Holocaust survivor dying there. Now, I know it's hard to see the silver lining in a lot of these bad situations uh, these days, but. Two Muslim groups in Pittsburgh actually raised over $200,000 
to put towards the victims and their families from this awful shooting. So yes, there's bad things that go on, but if we can look and see the good that's coming out of it, then we're gonna be okay. I completely agree. And 15,000 active duty troops will mobilize to prevent Central American migrants from entering the United States. Only 20% of the 7,000 are expected to complete the journey. Military planners are concerned about armed militias coming to the border where the U.S. troops are. Trump has described these caravans as a danger to national security. He also describes the migrants as, quote, unknown Middle Easterners and very tough fighters. Other concerns are that terrorists and traffickers will grow the migrant group, leading to an increase of cross-border engagements. So I think the thing we have to remember here is that these immigrants aren't leaving just because they want to. These people are evading persecution, poverty, violence in their home country. And yes, this is bigger than migrant caravans in the past, which were only about 100 or a couple hundred. So I think it's interesting that in another two weeks or so, they're going to be at the U.S. border and we're going to have to see how this all plays out. Yeah, and definitely President Trump sending all these troops to the border and uh, saying that there will be violence involved is definitely a very, very uh, interesting but scary event. And I guess we'll just have to see when they get closer. Yes, Oprah, the midterm elections are just around the corner and everyone is pitching in. With campaigns in the home stretch, celebrities and politicians are doing everything they can to help the nominees that they support. Oprah was in Georgia on Thursday, knocking on doors and speaking to crowds for the Democratic nominee for governor, Stacey Abrams. And former President Barack Obama was in Florida yesterday, campaigning for nominees for Senate and governor there. But closer to home, Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders is next door in the 22nd District campaigning for Claudia Tenney, who is in a tight race herself to hang on to her seat in Congress. Everyone's getting involved. I mean, what would you do if Oprah was in your town or knocked on your door telling you to vote for someone? Honestly, if Oprah knocked on my door, I think that I would scream and like pass out because I am such a huge fan the of full Oprah. Josh Peck, oh yeah. my god. Oh my god. I <laughs> love that reference. Yes. No, I uh, would be so excited, but I'm so excited to see all of these people getting so uh, politically active, including Taylor Swift too. So she just came out for the first time and like her entire career and endorsed a Democratic uh, candidate for Tennessee. So that's very exciting. Yeah, everyone seems to be getting involved, even though you said VP Mike Pence was saying that he doesn't want people to, to speak out as much. But hey, it's 2018. We have a voice. We're going to share it. And uh, if you want more updates on the midterm elections, be sure to check out the special election uh, coverage from Citrus TV Tuesday uh, at 8 p.m. And it isn't just celebrities and politicians getting involved in the election. Ben & Jerry's ice cream is also making its mark. The company announced the arrival of their newest flavor, Pecan Resist, a play on We Can Resist. Uh, it's to send a message of support to those fighting against racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia. Ben & Jerry's is donating $25,000 to organizations committed to social change and is encouraging their customers to learn about their causes. And no matter what your politics are, it's safe to say, pecan resist a pun. Ah, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> All puns aside, I, I do have to say, I think it's great that Ben & Jerry's is sticking with the times, staying woke, and, and just putting themselves out there and, and speaking for their cause, and I mean, the best way they can. I mean, it's uh, their ice cream. I think people are going to buy it. Yeah, and make sure you get this flavor because it is a limited edition. But however, a lot of people um, are not the biggest fan of this, and they said that the company should just stick to ice cream instead of making political statements. Stick to ice cream, shut up and dribble. We've heard that, that argument be made in 2018, and I think it's just debunked. We have a voice. We have social media. We have all these different platforms. We're going to speak. And a, a not-so-ugly duckling has strayed rather far from its pond and right into the middle of Manhattan. New Yorkers are flocking to Central Park to see this beautiful, rare mandarin duck. The creature, which is native to East Asia, is known for its multicolored feathers and hot pink bill. Nobody understands how the duck is in Manhattan, as New Yorkers are not allowed to own ducks as pets. But bird watcher Dave Barrett says he checked with every zoo in the city, and none reported a missing duck. Park officials do not plan to remove the duck unless it requires medical care. The health does not seem to be a problem at the moment. Morgan, I heard that you're weirdly excited about this duck. I love this duck. Okay, so I lived in New York City this summer and I am just so jealous that I'm not there because this duck has been in over 25,000 Instagrams 
and it has a, this huge hashtag, it's hashtag Mandarin duck, um, if in case you want to look it up. But basically, I just think it's so cute. Have you seen the duck? I have. It's a good looking duck. I'll give it that. But how many times this summer did you actually go bird watching in New York City? Okay, maybe yeah. none. But um, like. It's a duck. You're going to throw bread at it, it's going to come to you. Sure, it's cuter than most ducks, but okay. Okay, well then, like this duck, let's get this bread. After the break, Juice and Java Morning Correspondent is live from Audathon to talk about why hundreds of students are dancing for 12 hours straight. Keep it here. Leaving hot coals <laughs> improperly extinguished can cause a wildfire. Hey guys, it's Smokey! It looks as if Smokey is going to use the drown, stir, drown, and feel technique. After the first drown, a good start. Next, another drink. And finally, a close feel. Is it cool? cool. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Smokey, catch. Oh, my bad, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. Party fouls are pretty dumb. But if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Underage drinking and driving. The ultimate party foul. They'll test you. Try to break your will. But however loud the loudness gets, however many cheese puffs may fly, you're the driver the one in control. Stand firm. Just wait. And move only when you hear the click that says they're buckled in for the drive. Never give up till they buckle up. Welcome back to Juice and Java. If you've already had your morning cup of coffee, consider hitting the dance floor at Autothon. Our morning correspondent, Lilia Wood, is live at SU's Dance Marathon happening at the Goldstein Auditorium in Shine Student Center. Lilia, what's happening down there right now? I'm here at the fourth annual Autothon here in the Shine Student Center. We're on about two and a half hours out of a 12-hour dance marathon event. The money raised is going to go to Upstate Children's Hospital just up the street. At the opening ceremony, the Miracle families and hospital staff talked about their experiences to kick off all of the events. This is the first year that no one from the first Autothon either helped prepare or is participating in the event. So Autothon here at SU is officially standing on its own. This year, Austin Cruz is the executive director of the event. To see a group of students and a group of people our age come together and fight for the next generation of people to kind of come through SU. We have, we have students that have been treated at Upstate that are now a part of our team um, and helping us put on this event. So. The day is going to continue with games, food, and a lot, lot more dancing. Halfway through the event, the dancers are going to march down to Upstate Children's Hospital and perform their morale dance. So the children are going to come to the windows and watch all the college students dancing just for them. The children currently being treated who can't come to the event, they're going to have their own mini dance marathon in the hospital during SU's event. The new addition is going to allow the current patients to craft, dance, and eat snacks with their family. If the weather keeps raining, the MCs from this event are going to go up to the hospital party to connect both the events that way. What makes Autothon different from the over 300 other college dance marathons is SU's proximity to Upstate. I think what makes Autothon so special and important is our proximity to the hospital. A lot of other dance marathons, they're, the children's hospital that they are fighting and working for is hours away. Crew would like to joke that if you took away all the buildings on campus, you would be able to see Upstate Hospital from your dorm room. So, Autothon is literally serving its local community. Last year, Autothon raised $156,000, and this year they raised their goal to $200,000 because why not? We're going to have to wait until the end, until 9 o'clock at their closing ceremony, to find out if they raised that goal. 
Also at the closing ceremony is going to be the Circle of Hope, which is a um, dance marathon tradition with the power of people and everyone comes together holding hands and to reflect on the day. As you can see behind us, we have over hundreds of college students dancing with five miracle children. I got to speak with one of the miracle children who is 10 years old. This is her third autothon, and she said what she loves about it is all the college students coming together to dance for her for 12 hours. I'm going to go back to the dance floor, so Morgan and Zach, back to you guys. Thank you so much, Lilia. And after the break, we have two Remembrance Scholars here with us to tell us how the school is remembering the lives lost in the deadly Pan Am flight that happened 30 years ago. Stay right here. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason. Because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. Did you hear about the pony with a sore throat? He was a little horse. <laughs> Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Why couldn't the pelican? Wait. Why was the basketball court all wet? Why? Because a pair of cats dribbling all over it. Where did cats go on vacation? New York. <laughs> Hey, look, it's those guys. Uh, Are you good to drive? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? You go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. marks 30 years since 35 Syracuse students lost their lives in the bombing of the Pan Am 103 flight. The students were traveling over Lockerbie, Scotland when an act of terrorism brought down their plane. To honor their memories, last Sunday started Remembrance Week, a seven-day celebration of their lives and legacy. The week included a candlelight vigil, the tying of commemorative ribbons around the university, and honorary tree planting on South Campus. One of the highest awards at the university is the Remembrance Scholarship. 35 SU students receive the scholarship every year. It's awarded to seniors who are picked out for their academics, citizenship, and service to the community. The scholarship is the highest honor someone can receive. And today we are joined by two Remembrance Scholarship guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. So what has been the most rewarding aspect of being involved in Remembrance Week? Where was it? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's been really meeting the families of the victims and also people who are here from Lockerbie. Uh, so there was a team, the Cycle to Syracuse team, and they cycled from Arlington to Lockerbie and arrived this week and meeting a lot of the guys who did that was just to make really, truly amazing. Also being able to educate the campus community, we put together um, events and panels um, to discuss different things that happen. Um, Jim Kreinler, who is the attorney for the victims' uh, families, he also came to speak at the law school. So being able to use different events to educate the community about um, traumas of terrorism or the actual event itself has been really awesome. Yeah, And the main way you connect is by having your own person who was on the flight. So can you tell me a little bit about who each of you have and how you relate to them? I have um, Keisha Whedon. So she was a social work major um, from the Bronx and she was looking to work with disadvantaged youth, disadvantaged children. She worked with immigrant children um, in London. So Keisha's family is really um, they remember her very humbly, like she's a very sweet girl. She was very spiritually devoted and I've been happy to stand in her honor this week. 
Yeah, and I represent uh, Anne Lindsay Otenesak, but she was known as uh, Lindsay by her family. And she was also a social work major, but she attended Western Maryland College. So she was one of the students who studied uh, um, through SU's Division of International Programs Abroad. And she was remembered by her family as just an incredibly kind and generous person. Uh, she was, qu or her brother quoted um, her as being the person who would always be willing to help the man by the side of the road. And her dream was to work with deaf children. So it's been truly an honor to um, learn about Lindsay and it's inspired me to want to dedicate my life to service of other people. Amazing. So how exactly do you guys relate to them? I actually am uh, biologically related to Lindsay. Oh, wow. okay. um, it's a very distant relation, but she is on my dad's side, uh, like a cousin of a cousin. So I've had the chance to spend time with her mom and also spend time with people from my family who I haven't really seen in a while. So Yeah, yeah and so the motto for the Remembrance Scholarship is uh, look back and act forward. How do you think you're going to look back on uh, this Remembrance Scholarship week? Um, one of the things I like highlighted is the fact that Keisha is one of two uh, women of color who were on the flight um, when it fifthly crashed. And so the ability to just be a student of color on campus and be active and making sure that like campus is representative um, and comfortable space and inclusive space for all of us um, is something that I definitely know Keisha and uh, Pamela um, were championing and something that I hope to continue to champion as well. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And coming up, Landon Wexler is in studio to talk to us about MoviePass and what locals have to say about the service. Stay with us. I see you mobbing over her. Let's go. Let's mob. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Hey, yo, we mobbing. Come on, girl. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Boom. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Boom. Hey, let's crawl. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Now, 2018 has been a roller coaster year for MoviePass. It looked like the subscription service was going to have a promising future. That's right, but now we're seeing a completely different thing. They are on the verge of bankruptcy. Morning correspondent Landon Wexler went out to the movies to see just what people think of the service. Thanks, guys. This past year, MoviePass has become the subject of conversation for moviegoers and movie lovers. Subscription service lets users see three movies in theater each month for only $9.95. What a deal, right? Well, that's the mindset so many people had when MoviePass saw a peak in subscribers back in June, crossing the three million mark. The people behind MoviePass cannot succeed without getting people to the movies. But how often are people really going to the movies these days? Once every two years. It was literally the first time we yeah, got it all. Well, this is our first time. We just yeah. met tonight. Really give those uh, people a night to remember. So uh, MoviePass has been the subject of conversation for Wall Street financial strategists as well, as they wonder just how the subscription service is making money. Simply answered, they aren't. When they peaked earlier this year, nearly 2.5 million of their 3 million subscribers were more satisfied than any other subscription service, like Netflix or Hulu. Only four months later, less than half of their subscribers believe that to be true. So would moviegoers rather go to the movies with MoviePass than Netflix and, uh, well, hang out? <laughs> I, if you got it, I'll go, but I'm just not a big moviegoer anymore. You can get it on, get it on the TV. Not really, because we don't frequent the movies. Personally, me, I'm not like a huge moviegoer. I'll just wait till it's on like Netflix or like go on one, two, three movies or something. <laughs> 
Not sounding too good for you, MoviePass. Data from NRG Research Group say, say, surveys say half of former subscribers canceled because of consistent rule changes and some movies being unavailable at peak times. So if you wanted to catch A Star is Born on opening night and sing your heart out with Bradley Cooper and Gaga, you'd probably be turned away if you're, moving, if you're using MoviePass. The same survey says brand problems and negative headlines have current subscribers questioning the reliability and trustworthiness of the company. For movie lovers, the MoviePass is still available for subscription plans. But if this little spiel made you want to veer away, there are alternatives. AMC Stubbs A-List, Cinemia, Cinemark Movie Club, and Alamo Season Passes are available and have their own little twists and perks. Thank you guys and back to you. Landon, thank you. Coming up, our very own Connor Federico has some very crazy stories for you. Stay with us. Hey, look, it's those guys. Are you good to try? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? Go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. Got a quarter? They told me a bottle couldn't dream. That I would never become a superhero. But I learned how to fly. Just to come back in a new disguise. And be the hero that I've always wanted to be. Welcome back to Juice and Java. It's a crazy world out there, and while we may not have time to catch up on all the crazy stories from this week, we do have some help. That's right, Juice and Java correspondent Connor Federico is here with us to talk about stories we may have missed. Yeah, guys, you know it's a crazy world out there for sure, and there's just so many good stories from this week, especially from Halloween. A little girl photographed while awestruck by a portrait of Michelle Obama dressed as the former first lady for Halloween on Wednesday. The picture of little Parker Curry transfixed by the painting went viral earlier this year and charmed the world, and now she dressed up as the first lady and... Uh, in a dress that almost looks exactly like the uh, the portrait. And I just think this is the most amazing story. I think it's so cute. That little girl is so cute. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I mean, when Morgan and I said everyone was getting involved in politics these days, I didn't realize it's been quite this far. Right, you're right. It's, um, I mean, it's I think it's just so awesome to uh, see people dressing up as their idols like that. It's, it's really great. It's a very cute picture. Now I want to show you another video. Uh, NASA scientists playing with pumpkins. They had their own pumpkin carving competition here, and you can see they make their own jack-o'-lanterns, and this comes from uh, Pasadena out in California, and just look at all those different creations. That one's got candles on it. This one rotates. I mean, what else would you expect from a bunch of NASA scientists? I mean, I'm definitely very impressed because we actually went pumpkin carving, and <laughs> uh, right. I made a cat. Was so not quite as good not as whatever that was. Not quite as good as that. No, I mean, the, I think the pumpkin carvings are so impressive. Thank you, Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. That's all the time we have. I'm Zach Allen. And I'm Morgan Trout.